Father, our soul saves this morning to worship you. To honor you this morning, mighty God. We thank you. Thank you. How great thou art. And how great is our God. That's kind of been like a new hymn that's taken every church. How great is our God. This morning, Father, as we sing to you, we want to tell you how great you are. How holy you are, mighty God. We worship you, we exalt you, mighty God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. 
church, isn't God good? Yes. Yes. All the time he is good. What a privilege to be in his presence and to worship his glorious name. You may be seated as children's church and priests of our dismissal system. of God and get to know people. We know you are loved here and we are so grateful you've come to be here today. We were talking this morning even with Memorial Weekend. You never know how many will be in church on Sunday morning. I mean, some people are traveling away, going to and fro, uh, and I must tell you, it is great to see you in the house of God today. Uh, it's great to be in His presence. Um, you might turn your scripture to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to be talking about the freedom from discouragement. The freedom from discouragement. Romans 8 verses 18 through 30 is where we'll be reading from shortly. But as we go into this chapter, we did actually last week, it starts off with, there is now therefore no condemnation. Church, everyone say it. No condemnation. For those that are in Christ Jesus and called according to his purpose. And that was shouting territory to know that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have no condemnation. But my friend, I want to tell you today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have condemnation on your life. And you need to reach out to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Someone say amen on that. Amen. amen. So we read about the difference between spirituality and carnality. 
The reality is that if you're a carnal person, a fleshly person, you can't comprehend the things of God. But if you're born again, you have the Spirit of God residing within you, and you have a revelation of God, no matter what you're facing today, whether it be encouragement or discouragement, you can know and know uh, the presence of God in your life. So we know the difference between being spiritually reborn and that of the flesh. We learned then about also that if you're in verse number 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he is not his. My friend, we can know, you can know, you can know with the blessed assurance that I am born again and I'm going all the way. Praise God. Someone say amen. You're going all the way. You can know if you have the Spirit of God living in you. But my friend, you may be religious but not know Jesus. You may be religious or even know of religion. But if you don't have the Spirit of God within you, you are not born again. And there's a huge difference in also in that regard. We also know, as it says in Scripture, in verse number 14, that for as many of us as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God of God. Think about that. That if you're born again, you've been chosen. You are adopted. You are an heir of the salvation of Jesus Christ. You know, how many of you, some of you, you may or may not want to raise your hand, but some of you may have a vast inheritance coming to you in this world. Maybe a relative of yours is a multi-millionaire, and I want to be your friend. <laughs> But you know it's coming. You know it. And because you are an heir, because you are a son or daughter, and that you are an heir, that you will receive that someday. My friend, I want to tell you there's a reward coming to us as believers that's out of this world. That's beyond anything man could ever give you. And that if you're a child of God, you are a son or daughter of God, you are an heir of the kingdom of God. Hey, praise God right there. You're an heir of the kingdom of God. You are an heir. No matter what this life may give you, maybe it'll give you 10 bucks or 10 million bucks. I don't. You know, the other day, I watched the news, and that's dangerous, right? You watch the news? Be careful what news you're watching, right? It said, it was talking about the national debt. You ever heard of it? And every time the, the debt ceiling they negotiate, it comes up and Oh, the drama of it all. And at the end of the day, they raise it and borrow that much more money. Yeah. How many of you know someone's got to pay the piper someday? Yeah, right? Yeah, sure. right? So the reality is that there's a debt. And I, I heard that it said our nation has $50 billion in their checking account. $50 billion in their checking account. And that there are 24 billionaires in this nation that has more money than our government has. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? And none of them are related to me. <laughs> but I think about the difference. But you know, you can compile all that money of the 50 billion in our checking or the other 24 billionaires that have more, put it all in one account, and it does not measure up to what you have in store for you. Yeah. Oh, Amen? Yeah. No money can buy that. I mean, how much money, when the heaven is made up of streets of gold, how do you put a figure to that? Yeah. You can't put a figure to that. Hey, we're heirs, not shouting territory. This is uh, areas where we can be encouraged knowing that if you know Christ, you're an heir. You're a child of God. Yeah. I want to pick up today in verse number 18. Let's back up actually to verse 17 of chapter 8. And if children, then heirs... Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, and not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For, verse number 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he, is, he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with a pers perseverance. Likewise, verse 26, the Spirit also helps us in weaknesses. For we do not know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In verse 28, a verse that probably most of you will know for sure, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are the call according to the purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Let's pause there. So we know the scripture says in Romans 8, 28, for we know all things work together for the good for those who know Christ Jesus. Now we can say, praise God, we know it's going to work out for the good. But how many of you sometimes know when you go through hardships, it doesn't feel so good? Mm -hmm. It can feel difficult and in struggle. And sometimes we have the question is, why? Why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do we go through struggles in this life? And I want to talk to you from the scripture and we'll see what the scripture says about and that we're not alone in this suffering. It has been going on for centuries, specifically even with Jesus Christ. So, question, what do you feel when you're discouraged? When you're down and out? What are some of the things that go through your mind you start doubting, right? You start doubting, what am I doing wrong? Why, why am I suffering such a way? Hey, even this past week, I'm aware of some tragedies <clears throat> that have happened in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And you think, why? If God is good, here's another question. If God is good, why do bad things happen? Why, if he is sovereign, why is these things going on? Why is it, isn't everything good? If you're a Christian, then you should be think, maybe you think that, well, if I'm a Christian, I'm an heir of God, and he wants all great things for me, so why am I suffering? You think about some of these questions. Or, when someone's going through hardship, they may even become angry. <clears throat> they may become angry at God. Maybe the people around you behave poorly. Maybe a church behaves poorly. Maybe, you know, hey, I got news for you. Did you know this? The church is made up of people like you and me. And I know not everyone is as good looking and, and good as I am. Or maybe you're better looking and you're gooder. Is that even the word? Is that even the word, right? You're still gooder. But we know in Scripture it says there's none good, no, not one, right? There's none. But how many times, and I want to touch on this, that there are people not in churches today because of something someone said or did? Right? But your reality, hey, you come to a church that's, that you that you come to a church that's real and says, you know what? I can sometimes be kind of a mess. Well, you're the pastor, right? Hey, I'm purchased, born again, and I'm growing the faith. I'm continuing sanctification, and I'm justified, and I'm made clear, pure in Christ's blood, but I too struggle. And so do you. Oh, no, no. All of you have your tongue in order, total under control 100% of the time, right? You never say anything wrong. Hey, I've been married 40 years. I know the Holy Spirit convicts, but my, my wife can convict me too. How does she know that, man? Yeah. She's teaching right now, so I can, can I talk about, no, I'm not talking about my wife. You guys, 
I'm going to tell on someone. I, my wife was in Arkansas with our kids. They went to church with the, our kids. And I was preaching, and I said something I thought was funny uh, about my wife. I don't even remember what it was. So one of you texted my wife <laughs> while she's in church in Arkansas, and she knew about it before the service was over. <laughs> hey, it will find you out, right? It will find you out. So why do we feel discouraged? You know, here in Romans 8, 18, it says the pain that you've been feeling can't compare to the joy that's coming. And I highlight that scripture and keep that memorized. The pain that you've been feeling can't compare to the joy that's coming. The joy that's coming. So we know in the scripture it says creation groans. The world as we know it is growing ever since the fall of man. And this slide it says the waiting is sometimes painful. The groaning of the whole creation describes a state of suffering and dissatisfaction with everything we have today. We know, we feel, deep down inside that something's wrong. Our anxiety and frustration is our inward groaning. The reality sometimes when we ask the question, why does bad things happen in this world, is the reality is this whole creation is groaning. It's groaning, it's in pain. The reality is ever since man, the fall of man, things have never been the same. When God made his creation, it was good and perfect. You know, I was thinking, what was that like for Adam and Eve? Think about it. In the Garden of Eden, you, have you heard of Adam and Eve? Okay. I hope everyone has. Thank you. Come on, church. Have you heard of Adam and Eve? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, Adam and Eve was the first man and the first woman. And what was the Garden of Eden like? What was it like back then? I mean, if we're supposed to be rejoicing in what's coming, which is a whole new world, which is a world that's perfect, just like the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. I kind of want to know what it was like back then, because that's what's coming. Are you with me? So I did what any great pastor does. I Googled it. <laughs> so this is the best I can come up with right here. It sounded pretty good. What was it like in the Garden of Eden before sin? See, none of us know what that's like. We've been born into a sinful world. We struggle with sin. We continually struggle. So we don't know what it's like to not have a sinful nature. But Adam and Eve, before the fall, knew what that was like. And we believers know it's coming. It's going to be like that again. So I kind of want to know, what was that like? Well, this article I found, it says this. Most of us are painfully aware of how much crime, violence, sin, and deprivation exist in our world today. Right? I mean, if someone will go out here to the Garden of Memories and steal the urns on the graves, mm -hmm. something's right. wrong, right? right? Isn't that terrible? Yeah. No respect. That's right. That's why even with the, the Memorial Day, respecting the ones that have passed on before us, and also those that have fought so we can have those liberties, and those that are in our military or in our police force, yes. I, hey, we acknowledge you and thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Right? Can someone say amen? Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. If you ever doubt about that fact, just take a look at the evening news. No, don't even look. It's a mess. The Christian sees this as the effect of sin in our world. We know that this is a result of the fall of man. The situation persists because too many people love darkness rather than light. However, there was a time when the world was sinless. What was that like? <clears throat> What was life like before the fall of Adam and Eve, who disobeyed God and brought sin into this world? Well, Eden was a paradise. <laughs> Eden was a paradise. Garden of Eden would have been a climatic paradise that apparently needed no rain because it was watered by a mist coming up from the ground. Isn't that neat? No, and we know thunderstorms, right? We know lightning, thunder, fear. We know hurricanes and avalanches, and we know earthquakes. We know all these tragedies that never existed before. But ever since the fall of man, they now we have to we know. Everything about God's creation was made perfect. After all, he had pronounced it very good in Genesis 141, 31 rather. 
What God says is good cannot have any flaws. Therefore, the world in which Adam and Eve lived, it would have been perfect temperature. Perfect. What's that like? We can't set this, t this temperature perfect. You know, someone's cold, someone's hot. We can't get it right. But God's temperature is perfect. It was perfect. Uh, the perfect humidity. Perfect humidity. You never had to wake up in the morning. I know my wife says, uh, she says all the time, I'm going to talk about it she's in there. So she'll say, are you cold? I'm cold. I'm like, no. Are you hot? I'm hot. No. I'm okay. Come on, guys. You've got to help me out or leave me hanging. Right? Some of you leave me hanging right here. Uh, therefore, the world which Adam and Eve lived in would have been the perfect temperature, the perfect humidity without pests or disease. No bug bites, no tick bites, no Rocky Mountain fever. None of that existed. Uh, without anything that would detect, detract from their enjoyment of knowing God in a perfect, undiluted way. Surely this is what is meant by the word paradise. There, is, there was no shame or guilt. No shame or guilt. Wow. They had no shame or guilt. Adam and Eve lived in a, world, a life of bliss, of innocence. They had never sinned. Can you imagine being married to the perfect person? It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there you go. If you need marriage counseling, talk to Dan. He's not the dad. <laughs> so uh, they never sinned of guilt and shame. The life was intended to be. Uh, no mortal, no mortal since has been had such a clear heart of conscience. Now I'm coming back to this. Even to have no sin in a marriage, every thought is pure, and always thinking of the other more highly than yourself. That is awesome, isn't it? Yeah. That's awesome. Ladies, would you like to marry a guy like that? Uh -huh. My wife did, so <laughs> I thought I'd play off of you, okay? <laughs> she comes back there and she can let you know. <laughs> no, okay, you're right. Uh, this is a model to be emulated and preview of what awaits the Christian in the future. Uh, Jesus Christ is the only person who ever lived after the fall who was sinless. He's the only man. Only one who lived his life perfectly after the fall. Uh, everyone else experiences the shame and guilt of being unclean before a holy God. The only way this shame and guilt can be dealt with is by trusting in the good news that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sin. He died on a cross so we might be forgiven of the sin that separates us from God and results in the shame and guilt. Church, isn't that great to know we have come together to celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I don't have to have shame or guilt anymore? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Right. Yeah. Perfect relationships. Adam and Eve enjoyed a relationship with God and each other that was unhindered by disruptive power of sin. The Bible even indicates that God may have taken a physical form in order to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. Of Eden. What an amazing thing to be able to do. Adam and Eve were the only two people on earth, and they were privileged in a way that no one since, since then has been. They met and communed regularly with the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. Hey, God, what you doing? Well, just hang out. Dude. God's like that. God loves to talk with you. Yes. He yes. loves to be with you. That's right. And that's the way what, what happened with sin to us. But before the fall, it was a beautiful relationship. They walked and talked with God commonly. They met communed regularly, regularly with the creator of the universe. Uh, the first marriage. Genesis 2.24 gives us the first outline of, for marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This tells us several things. First, it tells us that marriage the way God intended it, would bring the man and woman back into that oneness in which he originally created them. A marriage that is dedicated to God. Guys, listen. A marriage that's dedicated to God by a husband and wife 
determined to do God's will will surely succeed. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. The problem comes as we start putting ourselves before God. And we need to continue to teach our youth, our young ones, marry a Christian person. Can someone say amen, church? Amen. Marry a Christian person that knows the Lord so you can share in that commonality. It also tells us that no matter how a, how a worldly, ungodly culture views sex, and yes, I said the word sex because God created it, um, God's original intention was for it to be a beautiful thing between a husband and a wife. There is no other legitimate, no other legitimate expression of our sexuality. <clears throat> This verse tells us that how the Creator meant sex to be is to be between a husband and a wife, period. Right. You don't hear that in a lot of churches nowadays. A husband and a wife, period. Um, and this also, the biblical record tells us that both man and animals ate plants. They ate plants, not each other. Hey, Christians are still biting and devouring one another, unfortunately. People divide and devour. So they ate plants. They didn't kill animals. They were vegetarians. This would have allowed them to have much less violent relationship than we see today. It appears that it was not until after the flood that God allowed man to begin to hunt and eat animals. Initially, Adam and Eve lived among the animal kingdom in a perfect peace. Can you imagine that? The lion and the lamb lay down together in total peace. Total peace. I'm sorry. I, how many of you camp out? This is Memorial Weekend. Some people are camping. You, you like to camp? I love nature myself. I'm getting older where I like a comfortable bed myself. <laughs> but you camp out and it's just something peaceful about nature, right? To be by a lake or stream and, and the mountains or, or the oceans, whatever you like. And my wife and I both love nature. It's not, it's not so peaceful. And But the reality is this. Can you imagine, I, this kind of draw, I'm kind of weird this way. You know, because what do we do when we go in nature? We get buggy turned. You know, Adam and Eve were naked. They didn't need any bug deterrent. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, they, they needed, didn't need to spray down with decon. They didn't need to, it was just, I don't know, I just, I just thought about how awesome that's going to be. No more bugs. Oh, it's like two more problems. <laughs> Oh, no more mice, no more like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Initially, Adam and Eve lived among the animals, okay? Uh, indicate that man was exercising God over them. God placed man as overall creation. Adam was to tend the garden, and Eve was to be his helpmate. This indicates that work was to be a part of God's perfect creation. Sorry, I'm feeling rushed. I don't want you to. However, since the ground had not been cursed, this would be a rather, rather, of joy rather than a tedious chore. Can you imagine getting uh, flowers, roses, what have you, for someone you love, your wife, girlfriend, what have you, and it has no thorns. Thorns didn't exist. Briars didn't exist. Think about that. How great this world was and will be. And will be. Jesus tells us that God rested on the seventh day and have blessed it and made it holy. How rare it is for us to even stop one day in seven. <laughs> Included in the passages where God was instructing the people how he wanted them to live, God formally declared the Sabbath as a day of rest. He said that work should be done during the six days of the week, but the seventh day was a day of rest. Did you know you're made that way? That we are to work diligently, but the reality we're made to rest at least one day a week. Did you know that God orchestrated it to where it would be the Lord's day, not the Lord's moment? The Lord's day. A day you consecrate to God. He created you, made you that way. And that's the way it was and always has been. He made where Adam and Eve would work. They would work diligently, tending the garden in its perfection. But yet they were stopped. And rest one day. And we're made that way. It's interesting to note that the lunar orbit around the earth establishes measurements for a month. The orbit of the earth around the sun is how the measurement of the year. 
And we also measure a day by the Earth's rotation in relationship to the sun. One rotation equals one day. There is nothing that defines us as a seven-day work week except in Genesis. Back to Eden. The end of the article. You ready? For those who trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Bible indicates that a new pre-fall Eden awaits us. It's coming. It's in Revelation 21. You'll read about that. When one becomes a follower of Christ, the heart excuse me, and conscience are cleansed and become as those of the first man and woman. The new heaven and new earth spoken of in the book of Revelation 21 is thought by many to be the recreation of the universe, a future place for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this, that we are a new creation in Christ. All things are made new. Hey, isn't that cool to think about what it was like and what it's going to be like? It's going to be like. It's going to be made right. It's going to be corrected. And everything we know from the time of birth has been messed up in our society. Even the way we think sometimes. And by the grace of God, he paid the price so that we can come before the Father with no shame. No more, no more sorrow in that regard. But the reality is this. Creation is groaning ever since then. It's groaning ever since then. Why is it you can go to a, a stream and, and enjoy the presence of nature and even a, a beautiful flower, and moments later it can be a raging flood? That's because our world is, is that way. But it's going to be made right. So one thing I want to encourage you is that why bad things happen around us is because this whole creation is groaning within itself. Secondly, we too, it says in Scripture, not only so, but we ourselves, who have been the first fruits of the, of the who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So first, creation is growing, everything we know around us. Secondly, our bodies are growing. You know, I turned 60 this year, and oh my word, can I tell the difference. I, I, I worked, I cut up six hedge trees, hedge trees the other day. And used to, I'm ready to do six more. Oh no, I was sore, sore, sore. And the next day, it was worse. But you keep pushing in. Our bodies are growing. Our bodies are growing. As a result of the fall of man, our bodies are dying. And the death is a part of the fall. Hey, I've got news for you. This is it. The death rate in America, statistics, is 100%. Wow. <laughs> you, you, I know it's a great revelation, isn't it? <laughs> Not even 1% escapes it. It's 100%. But the second death is up to you. What do you mean, Pastor? We all must die because of the fall of man. We all must. But you don't have to die twice. Jude talks about it in Q. You don't have to die twice. What do you mean? That second death the Scripture talks about is eternal separation from God. My friend, we know the presence of God. We just worshiped Him. We know the presence of God and looking forward to being with Him for an eternity. I can't imagine that second death when you have not chose Jesus Christ and you are separated for an eternity. That's a second death that Christians do not experience. So also it says in the Scripture that thirdly, the Spirit of God groans as well. The Holy Spirit groans. How does the Spirit intercede for us? We're groaning that cannot be uttered, it says in Scripture. Did you know God can relate to you? God can relate to you. It even says in, in Scripture, in John, and also Mark, that Jesus groans over this world. Jesus groans over this world. As a matter of fact, it's right there. In John eleven thirty three, 33, it says Jesus, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. 
When he saw the despair that was as a result of the sinful nature of this world. When he saw the hurting, the suffering, it says Jesus also wept. We know that Jesus groans too. And not only that, the Holy Spirit groans with you. So what does it mean when it says the Holy Spirit groans? Let's back up again. This world is in pain. It's groaning. <laughs> Secondly, our bodies is deteriorating and groaning. <laughs> Thirdly, is when we don't even know how to pray. <clears throat> The Holy Spirit groans. Let's talk about what that means. Romans 8, 26 says this, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with words and groanings. So what am I talking about here? You know, we can take that and even talk about prayer language and, and things like that. But in this scripture, and actually the next one even says that without words. Right there. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. An example, we do not know that God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed with words. No words. Not verbal. Even the King James says, not uttered. So what does this mean? When you go through the times of despair, <clears throat> like I told you, I know someone that went through tragedy this week, had a, a, a loved one killed in a car accident. 37 years old. 37 years old. <clears throat> and then we also, being a pastor, I've done funerals. I did the, a baby funeral once. Or even someone that's, uh, you know, different ages of life. I've done them all. And you think, this is not fair. This person had their whole life in front of them. I mean, when you think of someone that's 110 years old, and they lived a full life, and you think that they're saying, get me out of here, take me home. Praise God, God took them home. And I said 110, because I want to make sure I have plenty of room for everybody. <laughs> but when someone... 30s, 20s, cancer strikes, problems happen, and it's touched so many of us. We start wondering why, and we, we pray, and we pray, God deliver this person, save this person, or heal this person, and, and maybe it doesn't happen. Or maybe it's in the process, and we're praying, we're praying, and, and we just don't know what else to say, to speak. And we don't understand the moments. We don't understand the whys. We don't understand why things happen, bad things in this world. We don't understand, but, but we've got to continue to pray. Don't stop. Because it says in Scripture that when we continue to pray, with even groanings that we can't be expressed, that the Holy Spirit is there with you, and He continues to pray on your behalf. He cares and loves you so much. And if you're going through difficulty, my friend, I want to encourage you. If you know Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God within you. And He lives within you. And He groans with you. In a day and age, too, where so many people have experienced divorce. And some have said that divorce is worse than a death, even, sometimes. And, and so you take the most points, and you're groaning, and you don't understand this Bad things should not be happening if God is sovereign. But the reality is that he's going to make things right. Amen. In the meantime, we are in a world that's broken. Our bodies are breaking. No matter how much faith you have, unless you're Enoch, you're going to die. Enoch is taken, taken out to be the Lord. <clears throat> So we're going to die. It's a result of the world we live in. I don't like it. My mother passed away at 56 years old. 56. It's hard to think about that. 56 years old. That You lose your mother at an age. Some of you lost your mother so, you know, so much earlier, or even a grandfather. What you're going through. The reality is this. We can't lose sight of hope. Can't quit praying. Can't keep, uh, quit pressing in. Because God loves you. 
and cares for you. Just like Jesus wept and groaned, the Holy Spirit groans with us. Think about that. God groans with you and for you. He desperately wants to make things right, but this world is broken, and he's going to make it right. Hey, it's my prayer that Jesus come back this afternoon. I think it'd be great. Three o'clock is my preference. You may say 2.30. Okay, I'll let you. It's all right. We'll do 2.30. Hey, how many of us would just like just to see it all in? But some of you may be within the sound of my voice, whether it be online or right here, to think about Jesus coming back. And you might say, I'm not ready. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready. I've always said I'm going to do it someday because I know I need Jesus. I know I need the Savior. I know I need to get right with my God. And, but I, I'm, I'm too ashamed. Even some won't even go to church because they're ashamed of their lifestyle. I want to tell you, this is the perfect place for you to go. But pastor, you don't know what I've done. You know what? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, it's all water under the bridge. And you have to come to a church of imperfect people who love the Lord God Almighty. Praise God for what he did in me and has done in you. But my friend, if Jesus come back this afternoon, does that make you shout praises of glory if I knew? What would you change if it was 3 o'clock? And what if you came back at two and you weren't ready? What would you change? Would you throw some stuff out of the house that didn't need to be there? Would you quit smoking that, drinking this? Would you tell a relationship that's immoral? I'm done with this. Jesus is coming back. We can't do this. What are you waiting for? Jesus is coming back for a bride that's ready. That means the church. My friend, are you ready? Honestly? The pastor, you don't understand. No, I understand pretty well. We all need Jesus Christ. Amen. And when you receive Christ, you have benefits that are out of this world. He even groans with you when you're going through the hardship. Can you imagine me as a father, or Lisa as a mother? There's times when our kids, we want to take them and deliver them from some things they're going through. I remember it was like being a teenager. It wasn't easy for me. It wasn't easy for a lot of teenagers. And I had a solid home. The other day, a couple weeks ago, I worked a funeral. That was a 15-year-old boy that took his life. 15, from a seemingly solid home. Why? This life is not fair. It's not fair. He makes it right. God makes it right. We got to keep in mind that joy that's before us. Scripture says, "Keep that hope. Keep it. Hope. He's coming. I promise you. And I'm not lying to you. He's coming back. Keep that hope. Live accordingly. You're His child. You're His heir. If you're a child of God." <coughs> You know, we studied Wednesday night the difference between the Israelites who were saying, we are Abraham's seed. There's a huge difference between being Abraham's seed and Abraham's children. Meaning this, just because you're born into this world doesn't mean you're saved. Doesn't mean you're a child of God. It's when you receive Christ that you're born again. And now you're a child of the king. You're an heir of all eternity. Some of you are facing surgery this week. Hardship. As I was studying for this, I was just thinking about different things I know. They need me to think about what, you, what you're going through. And you know pastors go through it too? What you're going through. I lost my stepmother this week. Christian lady. What you're going through. And to know God is with you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he groans with you. And he will see you through to the end. See, the scripture is powerful. It helps us to kind of, uh, kind of understand this world is broken. 
and our bodies are aging, and God is groaning on your behalf, and he's going to take you through it. Oh yeah, he wants to take you out now. As a matter of fact, some of us have died. Saints of old have passed on, and we, we are, we're in sorrow, but actually it says in Psalms 15, verse 16, 115, verse 16, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of the saints. And maybe you were saying, God, keep them with us. And God said, I'm going to bring them home. I'm going to take them with me. They're with me. They're my child. See, life will be fair someday. But here's the reality of the moment. If this world is broken, and if you have a choice to choose God or not, and if you don't choose God, and then you shake your fist to God and said, how could you do this? This world's broken and you're choosing to rebel. But how could a loving God allow this to happen? He gave his son. He gave his only begotten son. His name is Jesus Christ. He gave him to you. And one of the most horrific deaths ever known to man, he experienced. And because of God watched, and it was even dark upon the earth for six hours. He took the sin, yours and mine, the garbage we did. He took it on that cross. And guess what? He died. He gave his son. But then after three days, his son arose from the dead. He arose from the grave. And God received him home. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He will bear the marks for eternity. And God says, what more can I do for you? What more can I do for you? And some will say, no. I don't want it. I want to live my life. And you've chosen to die the second death. You are the nymph. What more could God do for you? Well, he's going to make this right. He's going to reclaim this world. Ephesians 6 talks about that he's allowed the principalities and powers of the air. That's a whole other study. That the demonic forces, all oh, demons are very real. Yes, are. Satan is very real. Why is it that people will believe in evil, yeah. but they don't want to believe in good? Right. Well, I believe in Satan, but don't ask me to believe in God. Mm -hmm. Blows your mind. Do you know what? Satan is a, is a liar. He's a thief. And he's blocked the minds of so many people. And if you're seeing what I'm talking about, that means God has opened your eyes. Praise God, you see it. Finally, is this. Here's a prayer that I found that you can pray in times of despair. I, I really liked it. It says this. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't, don't know your ways. You bless, touch, heal, and save our souls. I don't know your timing. I don't always understand the reason why. Despite this, I trust you completely. I know your answer to prayers. I ask you to be with me always. Amen. I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, pray, God, I don't understand. I don't understand we had this funeral a few days ago of a 37-year-old. I don't understand. I don't understand why a 15-year-old would take his own life. I don't understand. I don't understand why she left me. He left me. I don't understand. I, I prayed about it, and things happened. I don't understand. But I trust you completely. And you know why? I know all things work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. No matter how bad it's doing, no matter if it's not fair, it's time to stop blaming our parents for what the actions I'm taking. Whatever they did wrong or right, you're still accountable for what you're doing. It is this, and you need to hang on to this. No matter how bad it gets in this life, whatever you're going through, don't give up on God. Don't give, even if you don't understand. And you've got to hang on to this because I know 
I know all things work together for the good. But I don't understand. I know all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called for this purpose. You know what he's saying? The season may be tough. The times may be difficult. It may be discouraging. It may be difficult for you. But you know, hang on. Because I'm going to see you through. And it's going to change. I'm going to make it right. Even if I have to call some of you home, I'm going to make it right. Because we know all things, not some, all things work together for the good of those who love him and call for his purpose. Right here, right now, some of you have experienced loss of loved ones this week. My heart breaks for you. It breaks for what you're going through. But I want to let you know you're not alone. There are millions around you that have went through difficult times. You're in a church of people that love God, that have experienced various things. And sometimes God allows you to go through what you're going through just so you can tell someone else to help them when they're going through it. Because it's always bigger than you. But you got to hang on to this. But you know it's going to be okay. The season may be difficult, but it's going to be made right. Hang on to that hope and that peace so you can get beyond the discouragement. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I can just feel in my heart, my heart breaks across the board just thinking about what we go through in this life. It can be hard, difficult. We don't understand. Sometimes we do have a revelation, but sometimes we don't. The Father, let us never quit praying. Let us never quit seeking. Father, let us never tell you what you need to do. But let us submit to your will and ask you to have your way. We're not little gods to tell you. We're your people, your children. And we cry out to you, saying, Abba, Father, I need you. I don't even, don't even know what to say. Don't even know. I don't understand why. I don't, I don't know. But, God, I groan. Father, I have your way. I submit to you. Now I know you're going to make this right. I know I have hope because of you. Peace because of you. Strength because of you. And you promised. You promised you're going to make it right. If not in this life, in the life to come, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's going to be amazing. Father, I pray if there's one today that's mourning, that's hurting, Spirit of God, that you comfort them. You comfort them, God, and that you would embrace them. And, and even as that scripture says, that you weep and groan with them. Father, maybe some that just don't know the whys. Life is not fair, and it's not. Because it's broken. But Lord, you, you're so good to never give up on us. You are faithful when we're faithless. God, in our weakness, you said we're made strong. God, we do pray for healing of our lives and our bodies. We pray for rejuvenation in our joints and our bones, but still the reality we know we are aging and that we will die. But God, I pray within the sound of my voice that no one will be foolish enough to experience a second. Father, Spirit of God, I pray by conviction of your, of your spirit, I pray if there's one that needs to make things right today. Change the trajectory of their life. Get right with you. With every head bowed, just for a quick moment.
but just simply just raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor, I need to change my life. Just raise your hand right quick. Right quick. See your hand? Someone else. Father, I pray for this individual that raised her hand, that, that you would redirect their life. You, you are so gracious to say, I'll, I'll be with you, but not only that, to empower us and change us. Show us the way. Show us how to walk. And sometimes we don't even know how to, how to run the race, but you say, just trust me for the next step. God, we love you, and we do praise you, and we celebrate you, even in the word of times of sorrow and difficulty. You are so loving and kind. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. If you're in need of prayer today, or maybe you some of the time at the altar of God, you're invited to come. The altar is open, and you're welcome to come and just say, I don't want anyone around me. I don't want anyone else to know. I just need to get along with God. Or if you need prayer, you're welcome to do so as you stand and sit together. When I find the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes involved in your when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, I worship you. Stay the course. Worship our God. 